Hello and welcome to the second video on setting up iNav on this model. Now, for those of you that are sharp-eyed, you'll be spotting that there's a couple of extra things on here. There's a camera and the antenna for the VTX. Now, I'm using a linear antenna, just a standard kind of rubber ducky style one, because actually that's perfect for a ground-based model. We don't need circular polarized antennas, and it's easier to create a seal around an antenna like that that has to come through the case. Now, if I take the top off, you can see all the brains electronics are in there. And in this video, what I'm going to do is I'm going to pick up from where we left off last time, where the boat had had all the electronics uh, prepared. Um, this time, we're going to set up the FPV stuff. I'll show you what it looks like on the bench, how it's all wired together. Again, all I'm doing is following the wiring diagram in things like the uh, iNav documentation. Then we will look at where everything's going to fit inside the boat, do the final iNav setup, and then give it a test. Now, again, I'm using a traditional radio. I'm not using a pistol grip style one. Uh, so I have done some funky stuff on here so that we have a forward throttle and the pull of the switch. It also then becomes a reverse throttle. I have also replaced the ESC in this boat with a reversing ESC. Have to be a little bit careful with that. Uh, some of the prop shafts in things like boats aren't a solid shaft. They're actually a coil, uh, which is great for helping absorb hits if um, your prop hits something. But if you go in a reverse direction, then that's not ideal because it's kind of unraveling the coil spring style shaft. But if you are like me and you're going to be running this in places where you might get hung up on uh, weeds or things at the edge, then it's handy to have a very short blip to kind of back out the problem. Other thing I've done as well is I've covered my uh, electronics in this conformal coating. A little spray of this uh, should hopefully stop things getting unhappy when they get wet. Because unfortunately, this is going to be near moisture. It's a boat. So let's jump into this. Let me show you, first of all, the electronics and how I've completed that. And then we'll look at how it's all going to fit inside the boat. So here's what the flight controller all looks like ready to install into the boat. Now, there are a couple of extra things on here, but don't worry. I'm going to explain exactly what I've done. It looks quite complicated, but I've only made a couple of additions on here to add both the power and also the FPV gear onto the flight controller so that I can have an on-screen display. So let me explain what I've done using diagrams. It'll hopefully make it a lot easier. So here's where we were at the end of the last video. We had a flying lead out so that we could power it to the battery and we had our S bus receiver plugged in and we had the connections to the GPS and compass on that port as well. Now, the first thing that I've done is I have soldered on an output that's going to plug into the ESC. Now, the reason I'm using a plug is because I am swapping the ESC around and also for commissioning, there's a little trick I'm going to use. But it means that this pod this creation of the flight controller and other pieces is also a bit flexible as well. I could move it to model to model if I really wanted to. Now that means that all of the power wires are connected to the bottom pad and the output wire is connected to the ESC. Now only a couple of things to think about here. Uh, first of all is that uh, with this being a relatively low power bolt uh, the current is going to flow through the flight controller in order to be measured. Now, in this boat, that's probably going to be okay, but in a boat that's going to be pulling 120 amps, 90 amps, it's going to be way too much for this flight controller to handle. So I would just connect the battery to the ESC and just have two little flying leads connected to the battery terminals on the flight controller so that you can monitor the voltage. That way, the current doesn't have to go through the flight controller. The only other thing I've done as well, you've spotted in that picture, is there's an extra set of leads. I've installed a flying lead, um, this kind of small red connector that's going to power the video transmission system. So that's the power system. It looks more complicated than it is. It just means we've got a place to put the battery on, place to put the GPS on, and a flying lead to power the video transmitter that's going to power and do the stuff with camera as well. Now, while we're talking about the FPV stuff, that leads me beautifully onto the next slide. So we're going to have an FPV camera. 
I'm going to have an FPV video transmitter. Now, traditionally, the way you do it is you would plug the camera into the video transmitter. The video transmitter would supply the voltage to the camera to power it, typically 5 volts, and then transmit the video signal out from the camera back to your goggles. And there's usually some kind of flying lead on there that you would plug into your battery power. Now, obviously, in my instance, that battery power connector is going to go to the one that I've soldered onto the flight controller. But of course, in this example, we want to have the on-screen display as well. So what we need to do is we need to cut the cable that goes from the camera to the video transmitter in half and connect the camera feed into the video in on the flight controller and connect the video out on the flight controller up to the video transmitter. And that will allow the flight controller to add the on-screen display information over the top of the video. That then leaves one extra little ground cable, which I have left out in the past and it's been fine, but it is a good practice to add an additional ground cable to absolutely tie the ground wire from the video transmitter to the camera to the rest of the ground system to avoid any complications. So with that all done, that's actually what we're looking at on the table. Hopefully it looks a little bit less intimidating now I've explained what I've actually done. So we have the video transmitter connected. We have all the different pieces. The big complicated bit is how do we fit it all inside the boat? Now, obviously, I need to think about where the flight control is going to go. Ideally, in the center line would be handy so we can detect the roll and pitch of the boat. So the flight controller has to go with the arrow printed on it pointing to the front, which is like that. That leaves the connector for the ESC. Then the GPS needs to go at the front with the arrow on the GPS module that denotes the direction of the compass pointing towards the nose of the boat. The receiver can go back where I had it when I was running it without a flight controller and that just leaves the camera and the video transmitter and that's going to need to go into the top. Now the camera, I'm going to put it as high as I can, probably here. And then the video transmitter can go behind it. I'll have to drill a couple of holes to make that work. So what I've done is I've just marked off where those holes needed to be, made small pilot holes, and then opened them up using a reamer, which is a device like this, until they're the perfect size for the grommets that I've got. They're going to go around the cables that go to the camera and also around the linear antenna, which should provide a reasonably waterproof seal. It isn't going to be completely waterproof, but if it gets wet, it isn't going to allow the water just to gush in. Now, with all of that connected, it is time for us to do the last bits of testing. Now, when you've put everything together like this, I'd always recommend that you do the standard test. So get your own meter on the input terminals for the battery. Make sure you don't have a dead short. Triple check all your connections are right and that you haven't accidentally plugged something in the wrong way from the test on the bench to putting it inside the model. And the other trick I'm going to use here is I'm not going to plug in the ESC for this bit. I'm just going to power up my little screen so I can see the display and without the ESC being plugged into the other side. And that just is safety, really. I'm going to plug in the main battery. Now, just make sure the radio is on so I can test everything is still working. Now, if you wanted to, you could use a smoke stopper for something like this, but I've never needed one. And every time I've done a visual inspection and tested the inputs that aren't a dead short, it's been fine. So I'll plug it in. Whoa, there we go. And immediately the screen bursts into life and we can see the image and the on-screen display. However, the on-screen display elements aren't in an ideal position and I can see I'm getting an error. So there's a couple of things we're going to have to tweak before we go any farther. So let me grab the cable. I have mounted the flight controller on a 3D printed uh, mount which lifts it very slightly. I'll put a link down below if you're interested in having a look at that. But we can still get onto the USB cable. So let me jump into iNav, click on connect. And now we're connected. First job I want to do is just very quickly go into the on-screen display. And while everything is all live, I'm actually just going to drag it around. And it's updated live on the on-screen display. I'm going to make the on-screen display much less cluttered than I would on a plane. I'm not interested about things like altitude 
all those kind of different things. Just really interested in what the battery voltage is. Uh, ideally, the direction and distance to home would be quite nice if I'm kind of uh, get carried away exploring a body of water. And also the amount of time I've been out would be quite nice. Oh, and speed as well. Let's have that in miles per hour so I can see how fast I'm going. So with the OSD set, you can see that things are now in a better position. Uh, you can see it saying that the compass isn't calibrated. Now that will stop me arming and going any further. So let's calibrate the compass next. Uh, and it's worthwhile calibrating the compass when it's all installed like this because it will uh, work better. Let's just double check the radio is all okay. Yeah, that's forward, that's reverse. Again, the radio model that I'm using here is available in the link down below. So we're going to configuration tab and we will click the compass. Now we're going to need a very long USB cable for this, which luckily I am using. And we're going to have to rotate the boat in all axes for about 30 seconds. Ideally you want to do this away from any magnetic fields and that's why the compass is in the nose. I've clicked calibrate. What I'm going to do is put the boat in each orientation several times. I'm going to twist it around and I'm just interested in making sure that we keep it moving in all axis for the 30 seconds that we've got. It'll tell me whether or not it's worked at the end of this. Just keep going and going and going and eventually it will tell me that it is done. Okay, that looks happy, which is great. So that's the compass calibrated. That should mean now that we can arm it. Again, best way to troubleshoot iron of arming is just to look at the on-screen display and tell you what the problem is. So we'll save and reboot that. That means the last step here is going to be going into the outputs and turning the outputs on. And that means that next time I power the system, it'll be sending signals out via the ESC connector and also the server connector too. So let's do that bit next. So now the outputs are all turned on, then what we can do is uh, plug in the ESC, which I've done here in preparation to turn the radio on, and we'll plug it into iNav for the last bit. So with the ESC powered, plugged in there, we are going to have power uh, potentially run the uh, ESC, so we need to be ready to unplug it quickly, and we're also going to plug it into the computer. So let's plug the battery in, and whoop, we can see the servo moving, and we can also see everything powering up. I just unplug that, there we go. Yep, everything's still okay. So the fact we've got the ESC plugged in has not damaged anything, and it's obviously supplying power because we have the rudder working. So that is a really good sign. Um, don't have to quickly unplug it. So let's plug in the USB cable and then we can jump on the computer and just do the last couple of things. Only thing we really need to do here is make sure that we can arm the model and run the prop, but also put the rudder back into the position it needs to. So on the computer, I'm gonna click connect and then what we'll do is I move the rudder on the control and is that moving in the right direction? It is, that's great. So if it had been moving in the wrong direction, then all I'd do is come into the outputs and click on reverse here. Now I have changed the midpoint of this already. What you do is just click live and then move, change the number, keep uh, changing the number until the rudder is back in the position that you want. And then you can just save that and then that's all good. Now the only other thing of course is that we need to be able to arm it. Unfortunately with the boat being inside it's not going to get enough GPS satellites so uh, I have tested it outside and it does get a GPS lock and when the GPS lock happens I can arm it and then raising the throttle does start the motor and then pulling the little stick at the bottom and putting the uh, ESC into reverse also works beautifully as well. So we are ready to take it out, out onto the water. So let's do that next. So here is the very first tentative test. Now just made sure I could arm it and that I could run the motor. Needed to leave it sat for a couple of minutes just to get all of the GPS satellites all ready and uh, double check that the rudder was moving okay. And this is the film from genuinely my first try with this. Now I will admit to being a little bit anxious because this is the very first time I've put I now on a boat on the model, throttle up just a fraction, 
and away we go. Now I'll uh, zoom in on the on-screen display. I'm literally tickling the throttle here just to make sure that I don't overturn it and I'm kind of watching for any kind of weird issues with the boat. I am having to trim the rudder a little bit and I will go back into iNav and see what that new value is and then set that as the midpoint and then remove the trim from the radio. That way uh, the, the boat should go more or less straight all the time. On-screen display is working okay. A little bit of interference from the motor, so we'll see what it's like when we get it up to faster speeds. Uh, hopefully you can see here things like the distance direction to home arrow, things like the percentage throttle. Uh, interestingly, the throttle's working slightly differently here. Uh, even though the bi-directional throttle is turned on in iNav, it's still showing it's 50% throttle rather than uh, a percentage throttle forward, percentage throttle reverse. Um, again, just poodling along. We're only getting two or three miles an hour, and I know that because I can now see it in my on-screen display. But everything seems to be working really nicely. Uh, bouncing around on its own wake, but it's, it's doing okay. Um, interestingly, some of the direction to home stuff uh, isn't completely happy. Maybe the compass needs to be recalibrated. Uh, there we go. As soon as we start moving, it seems to sort itself out a little bit more. But I would say that this is an initial success. So that's iNav set up on a boat. Um, I'm going to save these settings, and this it could be a cool platform to go exploring and potentially run missions in open bodies of water as well. So just quickly show you what the summary screen looks like. Exactly the same as normal. It works. So there we have it. That's I now set up in a boat. Uh, stay with it. Make sure you are subscribing and have the bell notification icon turned on. What I'm going to do is I'm going to save the settings for this iNav installation. Uh, and what we'll do in the next video is we'll actually put our do boat on it and we'll see what the differences are. Because um, Ardu Boat is a little bit more sophisticated than the iNav Rover technology. Uh, and it will be fun to kind of compare the two and what they're like as they are now. Thank you for watching my video and watching right to the very end. If you want to find out what I'm currently working on, you can follow me on social media by searching for Painless360 in the usual places. If you'd like to become part of the Inner Circle, then you can become a Patreon. Details are in the description and you get lots of additional benefits. Check out the playlist section on the channel too. I organize all of my videos into playlists and it's called something like Introduction to or for Beginners. All of the content is aimed so that you can start at the very beginning and it teaches you that subject starting with simple principles and moving up to teach you everything you need to know.